who grew up, and you still, you live in Washington State. Yes. You grew up in Oregon. Correct. Okay. Wonderful. And you graduated from Yale 1967, correct? Class correct. of 67. Yes. Got it. Got it. Well, we are hoping for no Zoom bombers tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Always exciting. Yeah. That would be yeah. your first one. <laughs> oh, we have some great Marines in the room. You Marines are really something. It's it's quite a fraternity. Yeah. It is. Wholehearted people. And I just I, I'm relentless in making fun of Marines and <laughs> it just grew up and you still you live in washington state oh yeah. you grew up in oregon correct okay okay all right all right we'll get the music started and let everyone all in right got it No. Have I hit? Hey, good evening, everyone, okay. and welcome to our you BBC watch. special edition of BBC Happy Hour. I am Todd. This is our weekly conversation with veterans about their service. And here we are, I'm, we're, I know Sean's trying to mute people, keep people muted. This is our weekly conversation that we have with veterans about their service, uh, brought to you by the Veterans Breakfast Club. And we are a Pittsburgh-based nonprofit that creates communities of listening around veterans oh, and their stories. And this special edition of BBC Happy Hour, as you, most of you know, uh, is uh, BBC Happy Hour is mostly on... I'm sorry. I'm gonna I'm gonna pause for a second here. Sean, are we okay? Yeah, yeah. I'm just uh, going through and muting. If everyone can come in and mute yourselves, thank you so much. Welcome to tonight's program. All right. Yeah. I think we were having. I think maybe people came on without it being muted, and that was probably an R end problem. We've been having a little bit of issues with our Zoom link, uh, but uh, I think everything will be good tonight. We usually have this program, BBC Happy Hour, on Monday nights at 7, but this is a special edition because we have the great Carl Melantes joining us from his home in Washington State. Hello, Carl. How are you? Hello. I'm good. Nice to see you. We're, you're here because of Thomas Gurnow, and I want to thank him for connecting us with Carl Merlantis. This is a really a, a special night for us. If For those of you who aren't familiar with Carl's story, is um, he was a Marine Corps officer when he graduated Yale University in 1967. He was awarded the very prestigious Rhodes Scholarship. He managed to last in Oxford studying under the Rhodes Scholarship for one semester when he decided to quit and fulfill his obligations with the Marine Corps. That meant he was going to Vietnam where he was a platoon leader for Charlie Company, 1st Battalion, 4th Marines, later became company commander. And uh, Carl served in a very hard year of combat, 13 months uh, in Vietnam, came home wounded and highly decorated with the Navy Cross, the second highest award you could receive in the military, in the Navy behind the Medal of Honor. Uh, war transformed him, I think as it does everybody. But to our great fortune, Carl did something that most people don't do. He decided to write about that experience and that transformation. And that gave us a gift that um, we've been enjoying ever since I think the book was published in 2010. And that book was the, the great novel Matterhorn, considered I think the greatest work of fiction to come out of the Vietnam War. And uh, he followed that up two years later with what it is like to go to war, which is the nonfiction memoir, kind of a, a maybe a companion piece to Matterhorn. Uh, he has also published a third book that came out three years ago called Deep River, a novel. This is off brand, Carl, because it's not about <laughs> Vietnam. Stick to Vietnam, will you please? <laughs> um, <laughs> and I'm, I, I, I am, re as, a, as a historian and as one who originally specialized in the 19th century, I'm very much interested in this book, especially as many of you know, I've 
I have a great interest in uh, research interest in hobos. And uh, there were a lot of hobos in the Pacific Northwest and they cut down big trees like, uh, like what's on this on the cover. Uh, Is there a special name for a saw like that? Uh, misery whip. <laughs> misery whip. That's what it is? Uh, yeah. I would but, imagine. No, they're, just, they're just called crosscut saws. Uh, that just, you know, they're different lengths. And it, to get a tree like that down, they had to be, they had to be long. You know, Two, one, one man on one side, one man on the other side. From everything I've read about logging, especially in the great Pacific Northwest, it seems like there would be, there's kind of an occupational equivalent of war uh, when you're in there in that <laughs> rainforest. With the, it's the, extremely the, dangerous. Uh, still is today. It's today. It's still the most dangerous job. I mean, far in excess of, of, uh, of any others. What comes next is, is fishing and crabbing out, out in the ocean. And, uh, but uh, there's cables that break and they, they, they travel everywhere, trees fall down, logs roll on you, trucks. I mean, it's, it's just an extremely dangerous job and it's safer today than it was when I was a kid. Yeah. And, and I, I often think of the, you know, what do they call it? The quiet heroism. I mean, these guys would get up every morning at 4.30 in the morning and they'd have breakfast and they'd go off to a job where literally six of my friends lost their fathers during the time I was growing up. Six. And that was a little town. I mean, you know, a town of 2,500 people. There was generally a death every year. And it was just like, uh, yeah, the church bells would ring and you'd go like, uh-oh, something happened in the woods today. And so it was a dangerous job. So when you say it's, you know, it's kind of close, it's like war in the sense that these guys faced, you know, death. I mean, it was, it, and didn't think anything of it. it was, that's what's so amazing. They just come home and, you know, have dinner and, you know, read the paper or something, go to bed, wake up the next day and go do it all again. And uh, uh, you, you just got to take your hat off to that. And the, the one of the ironies of this is that that bravery, little tiny people, look how big they are. Look, and, you know, I mean, they're not even a quarter of the size of those logs when they're laying down. It sometimes would take them a couple of days to get one of these big trees down. The heroism, this work, and uh, the irony is that the old growth forest is gone. Yeah. Uh, my great uncle, I remember my great uncle telling me, he said, we thought we couldn't cut it out because it would grow faster than we could cut it. And then he said, some German invented the chainsaw. Right. And technology, it just, it, that, was, that was the end of the old growth forest. Yeah. It was no longer a fair fight. No. Chainsaw and an old, right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's fascinating. And I have a lot of questions about this book and also where you grew up. You know, I'm here, uh, the Veterans Breakfast Club is based in Western Pennsylvania, which is a historically a steel making and coal mining area. And it sounds like we have a lot of towns that were probably the equivalent of your kind of town. Very hard work, very dangerous work, both, both in the steel mills and in the coal mines. And, yeah. um, and, and also a, a, a town that proportionally, towns that produced an enormous number of soldiers and sailors and Marines uh, mm -hmm. from World War II through Vietnam. So I imagine that's the kind of working class town you came from. Definitely, yeah. How interesting. Let me, let me, so I know we have a lot of people who are joining us for the first time. So I'm just gonna let people know that we are the Veterans Breakfast Club. Uh, we've been around since 2008 doing these programs where we have conversations with veterans and I'm not a veteran, I'm not a, don't come from military family. I'm a historian, a trained historian. And my job has evolved over the years to being somebody who just pesters veterans by asking them all kinds of questions, stupid questions that a veteran would never ask each other. And, uh, and in this way, we might get veterans to be able to share some of what they've learned, what they've gained through their exposure to military service and to war in particular. Uh, we have a proposition here that, that um, I guess it's a premise that, um, that the community and people like me really benefit when veterans can speak openly and honestly about their service, about the bonds and benefits, as well as about the burdens and traumas of, of military service, and that veterans can benefit from it also, that, that kind of sharing stories connects us. Uh, yeah, I think there's a healing quality to it. 
And then again, for the listeners, there's inspiration and there's education. And that's what the Veterans Breakfast Club is really all about. We do in-person events like the ones you see pictured here. And we also do online events like the one we're doing right now. And you could get our whole schedule at veteransbreakfastclub.org. You could also become a member of the Veterans Breakfast Club for 36 bucks a year. And for 36 bucks a year, what do you get in return should be your question. What do you think, Sean? What do you get in return for 36 bucks a year? The pleasure of knowing that you are supporting an organization that can bring you such wonderful programming like we are doing tonight. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly. You Did I knock that, that one out great, of the park? <laughs> you get that great feeling that you're really helping out a great organization. And we throw in some other stuff too, but 36 bucks would love you to become a member. Uh, you can go to veteransbreakfastclub.org and become a member. We do publish a lot of the stories that we hear on our events and we publish them in a quarterly magazine that we send out a magazine that has grown in the past couple of years into a full-blown magazine and this latest issue is out uh if you didn't receive it in the mails because we don't have your address we send it out for free that you do not have to be a member to receive it we send it out because this is the marketing that we do this is how people find out about us this is where people read the stories that they've heard on our programs and they you know they want to learn more and maybe support the organization so we're happy to send out as many copies of VBC Magazine as we can. If you want 50 copies to hand out to your friends, we'd, we'd be happy to send them. I'm gonna have a couple thousand delivered to my driveway, I think tomorrow, and um, then we'll be uh, sending them out and distributing them around because this is how people find out about us. You can get one of these by emailing me, Todd, T-O-D-D at veteransbreakfastclub.org. Again, or going to our website, veteransbreakfastclub.org, and just getting in touch with us, would be happy to send one of these to you. We have two sponsors for VBC Happy Hour. One is D&D Auto Salvage and Metal Recycling. Uh, uh, is, is, it's at, I mean this in the most res respectful manner possible. It's a junkyard. It's a glorified junkyard. And they do great uh, metal recycling, they do auto salvage. They have two locations in Western Pennsylvania, Lawrenceville and Tarentum. You could find out more and get quotes at dndautosalvage.com. And then we have Tobacco Free Adagio Health. That's tobaccofree.adagiohealth.org. They encourage people to quit smoking and vaping. They educate people about the hazards of tobacco use and vaping. And um, they advocate for healthier places to live, work, and play. They have a popular quit line, 1-800-QUIT-NOW. As we know, we have learned that people who join the military are much more likely to be tobacco users. users. Carl, did the Marine Corps teach you how to smoke? <laughs> no, we, everybody got there already knowing how. That oh, you knew how already. <laughs> okay, you knew how already. Uh, that's good. Um, so uh, again, we want to thank Adagio Health and Tobacco Free Adagio Health for, for sponsoring the program. We're very grateful to them. We know that a lot of people here on the program tonight have questions, and we want to make sure we have plenty of time for people to ask their questions. Uh, so feel free to put them in the chat as we go along. And also on the Facebook side and the YouTube side, Sean will let us know if there are questions as they come in. Certainly, if you have a question or a comment, please don't hesitate to raise your hand. We'd love to have you speak. But I'm going to start just by asking Carl about um, why he joined the Marine Corps. Uh, what inspired you as a young man to decide you wanted to become a Marine? Well, uh, there's a whole host of reasons. I, uh, so how do I begin? First of all, I mean, you were talking about my, my hometown. I mean, working class town, logging town. Uh, virtually everybody's dad and uncle uh, had been in World War II. And, uh, you know, the American Legion was extremely active. I mean, they put lights up at the football field and, you know, I mean, that kind of stuff. And so veterans were just everywhere in town and, and you grew up under the draft and you, you sort of had the feeling, but people say, well, you know, what was that like? It, it's sort of like income tax. I mean, I don't, no one likes to pay their income tax, but everybody who's got a, who's an adult knows that you have to do it. Otherwise your country doesn't work. And so it, you come tax time, you pay your taxes and the we sort of saw the draft like well you just owe it i mean the boys just 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 part of being a, a member of the republic you just owe owe your time and um you're almost you know certainly going to be drafted you can go into the army but if you volunteered for something else and you could choose another uh 
service, you know, Air Force or whatever. And uh, I can remember um, guys would mostly on the football team. I played football in high school. But senior year, they end of senior year, they disappear and they'd go to someplace mysterious in California called uh, San Diego. And uh, when they got back after, you know, several months, there were two things that you noticed about them. The first was they had something called a suntan, which, you know, you just didn't see that where I grew up. But the other thing, that they seemed to be about four inches wider in the shoulder. They swaggered up and down Main Street. I mean, and, and you know, you're a 15, 16 year old boy and I'm going like, I want some of that. I don't know what that is. I want some of that. And that's the Marines. And so that was just part of it. The other was, you know, patriotism. I mean, you, you, you want to chip in. The other is, I wonder what it's like. Do you think I can make it? It's the toughest boots camp of all of them. Um, and uh, <laughs> and then, then there's the story. This young Carl goes up to the Marine Corps recruiting uh, sergeant in, in Astoria. And, uh, and I, I said to him, you know, uh, I was interested in joining the Marines. And he's all, he's saying good. And I said, but, you know, I've got a question. I said, you know, I've seen... John Wayne and the sands of Iwo Jima and all that. I know what Marines do. They land on beaches and everything. But, but I don't know if I'm sure I want to be a Marine, but what else do they do? And he looks at me and he says, well, he says, we guard all the embassies. <laughs> okay. And so I'm sitting there and I'm going, and, and I literally, this is what went through my mind. And, and I, and I said, I uh, mean like, like Paris. And he said, Oh, absolutely. Paris. <laughs> and what went through my mind, you know, 18 year old kid was, well, the odds are, you know, you may not get Paris, but surely Rome or Madrid. I mean, I remember thinking that, you know, well, I got Vietnam. <laughs> anyway, a host of reasons. And how did that work? How did that, I mean, again, pardon my ignorance. How did joining the Marines and going to Yale University work together? It's not like Yale didn't have ROTC, did no. they? This was a different. Yeah, they, they, Yale did have ROTC, but the Marines had a special program and they still have it called platoon leaders class plc you join you just as an enlisted man and uh uh they put you in the marine corps reserve actually but what the way it works is you go to boot camp in the summer and uh then you go to college in the winter and you go back to boot camp again and and you know they try to weed you out and the deal is that when you uh, get your degree then you don't have to go to OCS. You've done it all. And you can go immediately to the basic school, which is the first school as, as, a, as a commissioned officer. That was the program that I joined. So when you were doing boot camp in the summer, did you, okay, I'm not going to ask if you enjoyed it because I know you didn't enjoy it. Did you take to it? Did you take to it? Oh, yeah, you did. Okay. Uh, oh, wow. God, yes. Uh, I mean, <sighs> First of all, I'm not an athlete. I just love I just love doing the obstacle course. I mean, you know, and see if I could do it better than anybody else. And uh, you know, uh, running around in the woods and 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 uh, shooting rifles. I mean, you know, I mean, I have to say that that was all pretty pretty fun. I mean, there, there was was you know there were there were the the terrors, the sergeants, and the screaming and and you know harassment and and all that. But uh, I took to it. I mean, it, there's just no doubt. I mean, it just, it's just seemed to suit me. And uh, uh, I write about it in that, in the book, what it's like to go to war, that, that sense of initiation, that sense of, I want to, I want to be part of this elite unit. And the moment when I, 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 I've written about it, but I mean, I, I got marched out into a swamp because I'd screwed up. I'd done so. Oh, I know what it was. I slapped the mosquito uh, in formation. And that was, you know, that's bad. And so our, my DI marched me out into the swamp, had me stripped down to, to just my skivvies and, uh, and stood me at attention and left me there. And he says, I, if I come back and you're not at attention, you're going to be in big trouble. Yes, sir. Uh, and so I'm standing there. Well, the mosquitoes, I mean, they started biting me and he'd come back and, you know, scream at me, you know, um, are you having fun? No, sir. You're not having fun, yes, sir. I mean, you can't win, you know. And and uh, uh, and he and then he'd leave me, you know. And then he'd come back another, you know, ten minutes. I mean, it was miserable. 
and uh, scream at me some more. And then he'd leave. And then after about maybe a half an hour or so of me standing in attention in the swamp, getting eaten by mosquitoes, he came back and, and, he, and there was something that transmitted. He looked at me and he was just, he, he was this sort of, you know, scary African-American giant, as far as I could tell. But the, he looked at me and there was something that he communicated with his eyes that, that he said, you passed. You just passed the test. Right. And he screamed at me. He said, how come you're such a goddamn fool standing out here naked with all these mosquitoes? Get the fuck back into formation. You know? But right at that moment, I knew that I was in. You were in. I was in. I, I, and he never screamed at me again. That's interesting. Uh, yeah. So it, that's a, that was a that was boot camp. There was something about it. We have a lot of great veterans with us tonight. One of them is Andy Niggett, a fellow Marine who was wounded in Vietnam in 1968. Andy is a good friend of mine. Hello, Andy. And um, he traveled with us in 2018 to back to Vietnam. We did a Veterans Breakfast Club tour of Vietnam. And uh, it was on that trip that um, Andy, in making fun of me or just talking in general, said that he was not a graduate of Yale University, that he was a graduate of Yale University, <laughs> that is Harris Island. So Carl, you are a graduate of both Yale University and Yale University. And I want people to think about, think about this. Carl graduated high school, 1963 from Oregon, travels across country to New Haven, Connecticut uh, to enter Yale University. That fall, John F. Kennedy is assassinated. Think about the what happened during the course of your that four years you were at Yale and your training in the Marine Corps. By the time you graduate in 1967, uh, Vietnam is, you know, we are full blown war in Vietnam. There's no, uh, there's no missing it. Um, the the summer of love would, you know, the counterculture would explode that summer. I mean, the country was really transforming. As you're training in the Marine Corps as you're taking classes at Yale, are you paying attention to Vietnam? Well, I can remember the day that the New York Times headline, Marines land in Da Nang. And I, 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 I had to go find a, 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 an atlas to figure out where that was. But I can remember that headline, March 1965, I, to this day. Yeah, because I knew I was I was going to go unless it got, unless it, unless we got out of it and got over, it, you know. But I have to tell you, there was also a part of me that's like, I wonder what that's like. I think it could be interesting. I, uh, you know, I mean, it, young men, that, that's it's part of you. I think it's I think it's genetic. So uh, of course I was aware of it. One of the things that was really interesting about that time, first of all, people talk about the '60s. The 60s happened in about two years from about 1967 or 66 to 69. I mean, 1965 was 1955, as far as I could tell. I mean, things just exploded. And the other thing that changed was, was the attitudes about service. Um, I remember about two in the morning, there was a big, big discussion in, in the hall in the, in the, in the dorm at uh, Jonathan Edwards College. And uh, they were talking about the war. And uh, uh, one of them said, well, you know, the, the Gulf of Tonkin incident was just made up. It's a lie. And uh, Lyndon Johnson's lying. And I was outraged. I was like, what? I'm sputtering. I was like, but, but, but. The, the, the president of the United States would never lie to Americans. And they all started laughing. And I was like, they're all laughing. And I just said this thing. I mean, this is a kid from a little town in Oregon. And these are kids from very sophisticated families, East Coast. That was a, a moment that I will never forget. That like they're all laughing about American presidents lying. And I tell that story to my kids, and they just roll their eyes. Well, of course, American presidents lie. God, what planet are you from? Well, that changed at that point. I mean, I, we, I wouldn't have believed it. Isn't so it's that a change. That's a huge change. I mean, that's a that's that's a seismic transformation that happened in this country and it did happen during those years that we call the 60s again like yeah. you said from 67 to say 69 um it, it, so you were kind of a fish out of water in a sense at Yale you were did you feel yourself somewhat of an outsider there you, you couldn't help 
helped out. I mean, generally speaking, as soon as you got back from Quantico, which is where we were, and, you know, and you started growing your hair longer and, and uh, fitting back in. Uh, and I played football. And so I, I, I was immediately just going into football practice. And uh, so, but there was always a sense, you know, of uh, why are you doing that? You know, I mean, you know, it's like, what are you going to do after you get out of college? You know, oh, well, I'm going to be a lawyer. I'm going to be a doctor or whatever. And I was going, well, I, I'm going to do three years in the Marine Corps. And there would be this sort of like, nobody would say anything, but you got yeah. this immediate impression. Like, are you stupid? Yeah. I mean, why would you do that? <laughs> you know, I mean, that was like, it, it, it definitely, you know, and uh, yeah, and it kind of, uh, it, it was alienating. There's no doubt about it. And the Marine Corps was perfectly happy to say to you when you told them that you had received a Rhodes Scholarship, uh, that you could go on to study at Oxford, study philosophy at Oxford, and when you're yeah. ready, don't worry, we'll, we'll yeah, take I, I, I um, give them great credit, because when I won the scholarship, I knew that, you know, I, I was supposed to report as soon as I got my commission, I mean, my uh, degree, which would have been in June, uh, the next step was was uh, Quantico, Virginia, the basic school, and uh, they were really short of junior officers. It was 1967, right? At, right, at the, it was going full blast. And I, but I thought, well, you know, nothing ventured, nothing gained. I wrote a a letter to the commandant, and I don't know if he ever read it, <laughs> but, but but I got I got a uh, I got a letter from headquarters Marine Corps saying that Marines are very proud of, of, of the honor that, you know, and we're, we'll be delighted if you go to go off and study at Oxford, we'll get you in a couple of years. And I was stunned, you know, uh, and very, very happy. And so off I went. And so off you went to Oxford, uh, even more of a fish out of water, I would imagine. <laughs> and, and was that part of what would then inspire you to leave this, you know, this mm. rarefied atmosphere? and go into the Marine Corps to fulfill your obligation? No, it wasn't that at all. I mean, in, in England at the time, the, the kids knew about Vietnam, but the, it didn't affect their lives. I mean, they were getting drafted, you know, they didn't have brothers off fighting stuff. The, what, what hit me is that I had guys that I had gone through uh, training with who I knew were going over there and by the time fall, you know, the end of the fall semester that had gone over there, uh, six boys from my high school died over there. And uh, not all of them had died by that time, but I knew several of my high school friends who were in Vietnam fighting. And here I was having a great time, you know, drinking beer and hanging out with the girls. And, and I, I can't tell you, it, 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 it was one of these real horrible dilemmas I felt, I guess the word is guilty because I wasn't pitching in, you know, I mean, they were doing their bit and I was over here having fun. And uh, on the other hand, the war was looking really sort of, I mean, I, I didn't, I didn't think the war made much sense. I mean, I had always, you know, sort of imagined that I would do sort of World War II like my dad, but didn't have that moral ease. This was tough. And uh so I had, I was, I was sort of saying, I got to do something. I can't just hide behind the privilege of this scholarship. But I remember thinking that way. Uh, so either I have to desert because it would have been desertion and go to Sweden or Algeria. And those are the two countries that were taking deserters. I think I would have preferred Sweden or I have to go into the Marine Corps and uh, I mean, go, go active. I, I struggled with it. And I had a very close friend, Mike Fredrickson, who, who, uh, he and I spent the whole night talking about it. And that morning he left and turned in his draft card and, and went to Canada. And I sent my, I, and I, I sent a letter off to the Marine Corps. Uh, it was, uh, it, it, it's hard to remember those times, you know, how, how the kids were faced with these dilemmas. Um, but I'd sworn an oath, you know, to defend the constitution. And if the president said, go, then if you don't go, you're a banana republic. I mean, it's like the military has already made its choices. It's up to the civilians to figure out what to do with them. And I, I felt that very strongly. So if I, if I wasn't going to do that, then I'd have to leave the country. So I, I didn't, you know, and off I went. What did your parents think of that decision? 
Well, you know, I think they had mixed feelings. Like I said, my dad was a World War II veteran. He fought through the Bukaj country, was, was in the Battle of the Bulge. And, and uh, uh, my mother was horrified and uh, at the same time proud. You know, mixed feelings. I mean, you're, you're proud when your kid makes a tough choice and then, you know, scared that he's never going to come back. So, uh, and that's where they were. Your father was a combat veteran of World War II. Did he give you any advice before you went to Vietnam? <laughs> no. <laughs> in fact, I'm going to tell you it was this funny story. I mean, it's like we were having Christmas dinner and my kids are adults. I have five children and we were all sitting around. And so, it's, so it was, my dad was in his 80s. And uh, my oldest boy says, uh, gosh, he says, you know, the Battle of the Bulge was going on right about this time. And uh my father at the end of the table lifts his head up from his plate. And he says, yeah, I was in that. And then he puts his head back down. <laughs> that was, a, that was the sum total, of, you know, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I was in that and that's it. That's all I heard about the battle of the bulge from my dad. You know, That was the first you heard of it. That was the first I heard of it. I'd never known he was even in it. And, you know, I started to bug him about it after that. And I got more stories out of him, but, just unless you bugged him you know you didn't get anything out of him but i started to get get stories from him because i took the initiative so he didn't when you go off to war he did he say keep your head down or i, I mean not nothing no nothing <laughs> so you went in okay so well you know the other thing is i didn't even see him when i you know okay. after i decided I, they were in oregon and those days I, you didn't fly back before no. I mean, I right. couldn't get back there. So I was, I was over in Europe. And when I finally, you know, went, I went directly to, to Quantico and uh, I didn't see them until the, just before I shipped out to Vietnam, I had, I had, I guess it was a week or something to, to go home and before we left. So I didn't see them, you know, th until then. And they just, I think they just didn't know what to say. I mean, what do you say? What do you say? Yeah. What do you say? And I do have a picture of you. And I'm guessing it's probably right before you went off to Vietnam, I thought I'd share. Um, but I do want to ask before uh, I do share that. Um, here, let me actually, why don't I share it? Because it's, it's such a good picture. <laughs> and I'm, I'm assuming that you're, that you'll give me permission to share this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's the one in front of our garage. Right? Yeah, that's exactly it. Oh, Boy, do you look young. Oh, well, I was. And you just see that. Yeah, but you see, like, does this kid know what he's getting into? Yeah. Look at that kid. He's a child. <laughs> I was there 22, you, I think. 23. 22 years old, and you're there you are ready to go to Vietnam. Yeah. What's your first memory of landing in Vietnam? Oh, wow. Um, heat you know walking off the plane and just call boom my lord and it was it was fall um fall of 1968 and um you know i mean just getting hustled here and there and, and i i was in denang for a few hours they put us on the floor of a, of a some kind of transport plane i don't know what it was c-130 dropped us off at denang and uh i mean at, at uh dong ha and then then got processed that night and got got all of our all of our gear it's on a chopper out to vcb and then on a chopper with uh, rob lynn who was who had gone to the basic school with me and uh flying out to the very far northwest corner of south vietnam this this place and tom gorno's book uh, lz sitting duck is, is about that hill 1306 which which uh you know we were we were developing and um, I can remember, I mean, these are the stories that you like to tell because we're coming in and all of a sudden I, I hear this and there's bullet holes hitting this chopper I'm in. And I'm going like, holy shit, somebody's shooting at me, you know? And I mean, it was like, and I, I couldn't believe, and the chopper hit hard and we go running out and uh, they had, they had, given us sacks of mail and stuff to carry with us because you know that's one of the most important things to do and uh i go flying off of this the place wasn't even they had just chopped down some trees that's all we had it was that, that was a landing zone and uh i i jumped into this pile slash right off the landing zone and 
and uh, Tim Rabbit, who was the XO at the time, comes over and he, he looks down at me and he says, they're not shooting at you, they're shooting at the chopper. Where's the fucking mail? <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was my introduction. Welcome to LZ. So you yeah. are a 22-year-old platoon leader, which means you're leading 40 men? About yes. 40 men? Yeah. 43 was the table of organization. Did you feel you had, do you feel, maybe do, did you feel then and do you feel now, do you think now, that you had good training to lead 43 people in combat at that tender age? No, absolutely. Uh, yeah. I mean, the, the Marine Corps did a great job of, of preparing us as best it can. You know, there is no substitute for combat. Um, but I mean, we, I could call in artillery. I could call in airstrikes. I, you know, we, you know, we, we knew how to do, you know, the company in the assault, we knew how to put in defenses. We knew how to, you know, figure out, I mean, we, we had the science, the technology, a lot of tactics. Uh, no, I felt good about that. Um, but what it doesn't teach you is savvy. I mean, you know, after a while, you, you sort of, and I learned because I had this wonderful radio operator, Butch Thomas, who, who uh, he was 18, but he'd been there about six or seven months already. And, uh, and, I, and I'd, I'd start to give an order about how we're going to do something. And there'd be this, <clears throat> and I'd look at Thomas and go like, well, you know, LT is, it, it, Maybe, did you ever think about you know, maybe going around the hill instead of straight up, but like you're kind of, and, and then he'd stop me, you know, and I'd, I'd go like, you know, Thomas is right, <laughs> you know? And I mean, it was so, it was so wonderful to have someone like him and, you know, but within a, within, you know, a very short period of time, a couple of firefights, you start to know the ropes and, and, and uh, learn that you can operate under that kind of pressure. But uh, I think that Thomas probably saved the lives of several Marines just because of my stupidity. I mean, you can't teach that kind of stuff at the basic school. Right. So being a good leader is in part being a good listener, knowing when to listen to people who have. Totally. Yeah. I mean, totally. And uh, one of the things that I always remarked about was, I don't know what it is. I mean, these, like I said, Marines are very young. I mean, at the average age of my platoon, I did the math ones was like something like 18 and 10 months or something like that. I mean, average, I mean, cause you, you know, you get out of high school in June and you're 17 or 18 and a few months of boot camp and ITR and you're in Vietnam, you're, you're a kid, you know, but they could look at a new officer or a new NCO come in. And I swear within probably 20 seconds, they could decide, whether they would follow him or not. I don't know what it was. There's something about a person's attitude that communicates that you'll listen to them. You'll, you'll, you'll be, you'll be the right kind of person for them. And maybe it's because their lives are at stake and they're just really tuned in, but that is a scary moment for taking over a new, new uh, unit. Uh, if they decide they don't like it, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. prophecy. I mean, it, you won't work. And we've had a, we had a couple show up in the time I was there and we just had to move them out. You had to move them. When you move them out, send them just back? Send them back, yeah. Oh, boy. What is, do you remember your first experience of combat and what you felt about it or what you thought about it? Well, yeah. Um, it was just, it was a, a jungle firefight. And uh, uh, it was like, you know, the, the world just erupts in sound, you know? just, you know, it was, a, it was a point on point. They were coming one way, we were coming the other way. And, you know, just chaos, things flying around and I'm screaming at people to get into position. And, and, and you know, we already had this worked out. We knew what to do if, if we got into a, a situation like that and then calling in artillery and and uh and it's all over with in about you know three minutes and uh i never saw the nba I never saw him you never saw him no i mean it was just you know that was my first encounter how did you feel afterwards well uh i was pumped adrenaline was just incredible and uh 
you know, it, it, it was sort of like, I mean, it, 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 you know, and every, you know, if you ever climb stairs with a, with a heavy, something heavy on your back and then you're not watching the steps and then you take the last step and it's not there and you just kind of go like that, you know, boom. I mean, it was that kind of feeling. It was like all of a sudden, like, well, it's over, you know, and then you, you, and we didn't lose anybody. Uh, it, it was just it, luckily. Um, yeah, I mean, and, and then, you know, you, you think, well, I, I could have done this. I should have done that. But you're busy. We still had to round everybody up. We had to get back and, you know, finish the patrol and head back into the, you know, and call in the artillery, see if we could chase them with artillery and lots of stuff like that. But it was uh, it was just sort of a surprise. It's so fast. Uh, and then it's over. You know, I don't know how else to describe it. That was the first first experience. You know, in war, I, we have a theory here on the Veterans Practice Club. We talk about it that that um, that the experience of war kind of compresses the human experience into a few days or hours or minutes, even uh, that that you experience a range, a gamut of uh, experiences that you normally get over the you know course of many years maybe but it's compressed and one of those things I think you experienced and I think you you write about it a lot is this sense of like discovering this aggression within you mm -hmm. discovering the killer instinct I mean I think you have a story about how you kind of discover that in boot camp you know with the pugil sticks yeah is that what they're yeah. called pugil sticks pugil sticks yeah do they still use pugil sticks yeah they do um and uh, uh, the only difference is that they have more protective gear. Um, okay. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a, I don't know if, it, if the other services do it, but you take one Marine in, in the middle of a circle, the DI, you know, sh shouts at you and you, you go, there, there are these sticks with sort of pads on, on both ends. And uh, you just go in and beat the hell out of the other guy. And uh, you know, you want the other guy to go down to the ground. And, and uh, uh, that was, I can remember that was one of the first times I knew about this. Well, in that order, and I call it the mad monkey, but uh, I, this poor guy, I mean, I was screaming at him. I wanted to just beat the hell out of him. I mean, it just something erupted in me. The, the, the DI pulled me off, <laughs> you know. So um, that was the mad monkey within you. Absolutely. That was something you discovered within you that I think is is within all of us. Absolutely. Yeah. But most I mean, of us have the privilege of not having to <laughs> encounter it, maybe in our nightmares. Well, it's unconscious. Right? Yeah, it's not it doesn't have to come to the surface. Um, and, uh, you know, like I, I've said before, we're not the top animal on the food chain because we're nice. <laughs> all right. We're the meanest animal on the planet. That's why we that's why we're top on the food chain. I mean, it's and it's in us. Uh, and civilization's job and the job of, of consciousness and becoming an adult is to recognize it and keep it under control. Uh, but believe me, when your life's in danger, you want him out. You know, it's 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 part of our our survival. Uh, I think it's 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 a big part of us. And and shaming it is the wrong way to go. It's like shaming sex. I mean, you know, the Victorians didn't do too well with that. Uh, it, 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 you've got to recognize it and then you've got to learn how to use it and the, the military is one of civilization's great inventions for channeling that aggression i mean it's under control it's under rules it's it, it's working for a, a government i mean it, you know at, it, people think the military is 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 sort of you know where aggression's unleashed it's actually where it's contained you bet Gang warfare in the streets is where it's unleashed, and it, it, that is truly ugly. You know, Carl, to, speaking of keeping things under control, I have been, and I think uh, most people here who know me will admire the self-control that I've shown not making fun of the Marine Corps while you've been on <laughs> here, um, and, and Marines in general. But, you know, and I do, we do have this back and forth, but I tell a lot of people that Marines are the most wholehearted people I know. There's something about Marines that um, that I I love, and and I think you've put your finger on it. It's that they know something about human nature, maybe, 
uh, that they've been trained to be aware of and they've discovered it within themselves and they've learned how to handle it, how to channel it, how to control it. And um, there's, that is the, there's a certain wisdom, there's a lack of naivete, and there's a, a generosity of heart that I think a lot of the Marines that I know have, and I, I hear in your voice, um, but that doesn't mean I won't make fun of them still. <laughs> uh, I was, you know, I'd like to just um, take just a moment here. I know we have a lot of people here joining us for the first time. A few of them I've been in contact with. Larry Murley from, uh, I think you're from Texas, Larry. You, you were a, a Vietnam veteran from, he was, he was a, an advisor, mm -hmm. an advisor, 1961, 1962. But well, you were well, early, wow. Yeah, and we wanna hear that story because we don't get many advisors. No, no. Um, and I wanna hear what the advising was like. We'd love to have you come back on Larry and share some, Larry also has written his story uh, and I'll be reading that soon. Thomas Gurnow, you're also with us. I know I want to thank you again for putting me in touch with Carl Morlantis and having him join us here. Uh, and then Jim Berg. Mention his book, LZ Sitting Duck. Yes, LZ Sitting Duck. Absolutely. Yes. And he's now working on a book about um, the Hill 484 that you were on, Carl. Yeah. Uh, Jim Berg. I'll let you swallow that food that you, you're, you're eating, Jim. Uh, Jim was a Marine pilot uh, that Carl writes about, he says here on chapter 19 of Matterhorn, paragraph two to three. Uh, Jim, do you want to unmute yourself and tell us a little bit about that? What happens in those chapters? I, 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 Jim and I know each other, so. Okay. Yeah. There we go. Hey, Jim. Hi, Carl. Oh, nice last time you. Carl and I were together, uh, we were uh, Carl was selling his his two books, and Thomas was selling LZ Sitting Duck at Ellington, the old Ellington Field for an air show. And uh, thank goodness for the umbrella. Gosh, it was hot. <laughs> <laughs> Reminded me of Vietnam. I was gonna say, yeah, you're you were used to hot from Vietnam. So you were a Marine pilot, a helicopter pilot. I was, and I flew out of Fubai, and uh, one day had the uh, pleasure of responding to a, on an emergency medevac, which I believe Carl was uh, witness to. And uh, <clears throat> at least the description that he talks about what happened, uh, by the way, this all, what he wrote about in Matterhorn, I didn't know about until some years later when somebody said, hey, you ought to read Matterhorn, and I said, I don't, why do I want to read about the Vietnam War? I was there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, it's like your dad, uh, Carl. Yeah, I was there. I <laughs> <laughs> had all the bulge. And, uh, but uh, somebody brought it to my attention. I read it and I, and I was skimming through it, I will, will say, because a lot of it is about the grunts. And I was a guy in the helicopter way above the fight until we got into the fight. And I uh, came down to into Argonne on an emergency medevac. And Carl's book, Matterhorn, I would let him describe where LZ Argonne fits into Matterhorn. But Matterhorn is a fictional name for one of the many LZs that he was involved in, one of which was Argonne. And uh, we took... 12 bleeding people, 12 or so bleeding people off of that high mountain and uh, called in airstrikes because it was so full of live fire the whole time we were there on the way in and on the way out, plus a downed army helicopter in the upper zone. And I can't recall if the pilots were still in the plane or not, in the aircraft or not, but it was the first day of, of uh, that tragic Ma March 20th battle for LZ Argonne. And, and we do have a, a question here in the chat. Um, Rick asks about, I think where you got the title Matterhorn and I'll share the, the, the book cover here. Why did you choose Matterhorn? That was the name that you gave to the hill, Hill 484. Yeah. Um, well, I don't know if you are children of the sixties and, and into bluegrass, but there was a, a bluegrass song 
called Matterhorn, and the and it and it goes, men have tried and men have died to climb the Matterhorn, the mighty Matterhorn. And uh, country gentlemen was the was the uh, bluegrass group saying that. And the other reason was is because it means the mother mountain. I mean, you know, uh, mantra that it, it evokes that and and. Uh, Mellis's fiction, the, the fictional character, he has to basically move from being a child uh, tied into his mother to becoming a, a, an adult. Uh, and uh, that's why people say, how come you always talk about, you know, this underwear that he finally got rid of? That was his mother died that underwear and, and made it for him. He's still wearing his mother's clothes underneath his underneath the, his exterior, his persona. And uh, you'll, in, in the novel, at some point, you see where he's, he finally just says, I'm not wearing this anymore. He doesn't know anything about his mother. He's not thinking that way, but that's the symbolism of it. So it's, it's that song. It's, it's the idea of, of, of the mother mountain and, and uh, uh, all sort of. And then I thought, well, it's, it's also an easy way because people would, would come up with strings of names for fire bases that, some general probably just thought of about on a whim. And, and uh, so I thought, well, we'll just make, make a, the name of a bunch of big mountains. Yeah. So that's, that's how I came up with the title. You know, I had, uh, before we went live here, I asked Carl if he was the only Rhodes Scholar to have served in Vietnam. And um, I, I'm guessing maybe, maybe so. Maybe there was another one at some point. Brad know. Washabaugh, you did know a Rhodes Scholar in the Marine Corps? Yeah, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Robert Earle. Now, he was uh, later assigned to the uh, NSC with, uh, with, uh, with uh, the scandal that happened. All over North. Yeah. All over North. Yeah, he was caught up in the shredding of notes with uh, Faye, uh, the secretary and whatnot. So he was a brilliant man. And of course, he corrected all your typos and, and whatnot. <laughs> <laughs> You had to think in a different sphere, you know. You, it was like a chess game. You had to, you had to change your game and your tactics when you talked to him because he was like, you know, one step ahead of you all the time. And he would get that look on his face, and you could hear the gears and feel the gears turning. But uh, no, yeah, he was in the Naval Academy. Yeah, yeah, Naval Academy. You got it. Yeah. 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 Well, I tell you the story about. So I, I, I'd been there with my with my platoon for about I don't know two or three weeks and and by this time the kids all got pretty comfortable with me and Flaherty we called him flag squad leader from Boston I mean literally from South Boston he was almost a cliche uh one of the things to say about the Marine Corps is it's mostly from the South and South Boston and uh uh he comes up to me after patrol and, and he says you know he says lieutenant he says are they are they shitting us about you you know going to Yale and 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 being a Rhodes Scholar and then coming here. And I said, no flag, they're not shitting you. I really was. <laughs> well, you must be the dumbest fucking Rhodes Scholar <laughs> on record. <laughs> I'll never forget it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great one. Rona Simmons, Rona, if you feel like you want to unmute yourself, uh, please do ask that question that you put in the chat. I think that's a, I think that's a great one and um, we should discuss it. Rona? Hey, hey, Rona, how are you? I am. Thank you so much, um, Carl. Marvelous book. I am a child of the 70s and everyone I knew in college was, uh, if not protesting, they were being drafted. So um, right in that sweet spot. Yeah. Um, I, I really enjoy your book. I am about a third of the way through Matterhorn. Uh, I've read numerous books on the war and I feel like I'm going through the jungle picking those leeches off. I, I just <laughs> horrified. Um, <laughs> but uh, I have never heard two things that you mentioned. One um, was about the elephants and I was just horrified to think now that we're here in 2022 about calling in artillery on elephants, number one. And the second one, and I think someone, uh, Jim Berg uh, uh, in the chat also said, 
about the tigers. I had never heard those two stories about the um, elephants and the tigers, and I, I, I assumed they were correct, but I wanted to hear your your real story about that. Yeah. Um, the elephant story I'm not too proud of, but uh, uh, it happened and I have to own it. Uh, very early on, uh, we were, uh, again, there, there was, there was, there was, uh, a, a firefight and uh so we knew nba were around and uh and it, i was I, if i can remember exactly we had a an enlisted forward observer uh his name was um oh anyway doesn't matter what his name was young kid uh and they were and he was testing me and he and uh he said uh there's some elephants right down there in the in the bottom of that draw and uh, he says, you know, the goose around here, and sorry, that's what, what we call them. We weren't politically correct. <laughs> um, and uh, he said, you know, they use them for transportation. He says, it's the same as trucks. And I was going, really? You know, <laughs> you know yep, it's the same as trucks. He says, you know, we, we, always, we always hit them. We always hit them. And everybody's looking at me, and uh, I regret it to this day. But I thought, well, gosh, I can't just show, say that I'm not going to, you know, do what we're supposed to do. And if they are, you know, and I, I just looked at, looked at him and I said, well, OK. And so he called in Gook Transportation Unit and hit a bunch of elephants with, a, with an artillery shell. Uh, it's awful. I mean, war is awful. And you do things in, in wars that you just absolutely regret and to this day, that's, that's one of the things. I mean, I think about that. It's kind of weird. I mean, I killed a lot of people with artillery. I don't think nearly as much about them. I mean, somehow it's because I suppose the elephants didn't know what was going on. Yeah. But it's uh, it's it's just a real sad aspect. And I, I participated in it. And, and I wish I hadn't, but I did. Uh, the Tigers, it was in our battalion. Uh, uh, a guy on a, on a listening post, uh, which, you know, you're out there by yourself. Uh, in the dark, and uh, um, a tiger came up and, and hit him uh, and broke his neck and then dragged him off, and uh, my company had to go find him, and we did find him, and he was half eaten, and uh, we sent him home like that, and uh, uh, they, that was the only incident, because then, I mean, we were in, it was like a giant <coughs> national forest, I mean, we were in serious jungle and there were, there were no villages anywhere close. Um, and uh, there were tigers and elephants and monkeys. I mean, it was just, it was the jungle and, and uh, it was beautiful. I often think about how beautiful it was. And I don't know if it's the same today or not. And this is the man who was killed by the tiger, Francis Baldino, who is in one four. Oh, there he is. Yeah. Goldkill County PA. Thank you, Thomas Gurnow for that. Uh, for that reference, and you I've mentioned, never... let's see here. I'm going to try and share another screen, um, just because you you've mentioned uh, Butch Thomas, and I thought I would show a picture of him. This mm -hmm. is Charles Thomas, Butch Thomas. He was your radio man. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's him. And he was your advisor. I mean, he looks too young to be an advisor, but he had been, you know, he had been in, in combat before you. Yeah, look at the cigarette in his left hand, too. Yep, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Boy, oh, yeah, boy. I know. Yeah, he, he, he was a tremendous person, really tremendous person. And I've talked about it. I mean, he saved my life one night. Um, I got hypothermia really bad. I mean, we were up high and it was cold and we were wet and, and I started shaking and shivering and I couldn't stop because we hadn't eaten for a few days. And uh, so they didn't have much to burn. And I was clearly going down with hypothermia and he knew it. I mean, we'd seen hypothermia before and he just took me down to the ground and wrapped me in his poncho liner and, uh, wrapped his body around me and uh stopped and, and got me warmed up and uh i mean he saved my life and and what's amazing is he saved my life by hugging me i just you know i think about thomas i get weepy i mean just seeing the picture makes me weep um yeah he's a tremendous guy 
that's something you, you know, Carl, when I started reading about war and the military, I kind of understood that in war you got shot at, <laughs> you might get hurt, you hurt other people, but I never thought like you weren't eating or that you weren't <laughs> sleeping or that you were shivering and might get hypothermia. I mean, especially in, in Vietnam, I would imagine that that was a, something that people back home had no idea about. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um... One of my favorite moments of when Matterhorn came out, I, I did, you know, the book tour and I'm, I'm, in, I'm in a line signing, you know, there was a big line. I'm in a table signing books and this woman comes up to me and she's sort of shuffling around a little bit, obviously sort of a little bit embarrassed. And, and I looked at her and I go, well, what is it? What do you want to say? You know? And she says, why? She says, you know, I was in college when the Vietnam war was going on and I just hated it. I just hated it. I protested every chance I got. I was in all the marches that I could get to. I just, just always hated that war. She pauses a bit and she says, and, and then I read Matterhorn and I didn't know you slept outside. <laughs> College educated woman, uh, that out of touch and not that unusual. I mean, the, the military is very, is even worse today. Uh, separated from the civilian population i gotta say carl i can relate to that woman i can relate to that woman <laughs> i and i and I, I mean i i i think most of us really don't get it we don't understand what military service entails what this kind of training entails uh and then of course the experience of combat i say on memorial day every Mo memorial day that i was well into my adulthood before i realized that memorial day was not just a three-day weekend that yeah. there was something else to it. You know, there was something else. It, it represented something else. And that, uh, and I'm, I'm not alone, unfortunately. Um, I do want to ask you, you received a Navy Cross, which is, a, you know, one of the highest decorations you could get. Can you, for valor in combat against the enemy, what happened that warranted a Navy Cross for you? Well, uh, it's no secret. You can go on the internet, and read the citation, but uh, um, we were uh, lined up uh, in the jungle to do an assault on Hill 484. And um, they had, they were dug into bunkers with machine guns. And the, like I said, they're professionals, the interlocking fire. I mean, the whole, whole thing. And um, for some reason, there was a screw up and the air didn't hit it. Uh, we didn't get any prep. And uh, the word came, well, we're going to attack anyway. And so um, I had by this time combined two platoons under me because uh, we'd been fighting for quite a long time. And you don't, you know, the, you don't, when you, when you charge, you don't run. I mean, you're, you're loaded down with ammunition and you're, and, and if you run, you're exhausted within, you know, 10 seconds and you're, you're useless. So when you go up against a hill, a fortified position, you walk and you only break, break into a run if, if you have to get out from underneath fire. And so this whole line of Marines is, we, we emerged from the jungle in a line and started up this hill. They'd been mortaring us for several days. And so the NBA were all around. Uh, you don't have, you know, a big supply of mortar shells unless there's a big supply of people to carry them. Uh, and so we were, um, you know, um, hang on. Hmm? <laughs> My wife is shouting at me. Um, so the um, what and the machine guns opened up, the NBA machine guns, and everybody went to the ground. I mean, it's, it's instinctual. I mean, we we're all in a line, and the machine guns opened up, and everybody hit the ground. And here's you know Lieutenant Marlanis on the ground with them, and I remember I was behind a log, and the bullets are going over my head, and, and I'm and I'm thinking. If I don't get us out of here real quick, they're going to hit us with the mortars. And there was a there was a, a, 
guy at the basic school, Major Miller, redheaded tactics instructor. And I remember him saying to all us young lieutenants, he says, you know, you, you lieutenants, there's nothing that you do that the sergeants can't do except one thing. He says, someday you're going to know when you're going to earn your pay. And I remember that, that voice, that man, I'm laying on the ground with the machine gun bullets, knowing that if the mortars start hitting us, we're screwed. We, we, if we stand up, we're screwed. What do we do? And, uh, I said, and I thought, well, this is when I'm going to earn my pay. Hmm. And, um, uh, it just, and honestly, I mean, you know, people would say, well, you were just, it's a psychotic experience. I had an out of body experience. I, I, to me, I remember leaving my body and looking down on the whole situation where the machine guns were, where we were and, uh, figuring out something, a plan. And then I came back into, into my body and started shouting at people for people to take one of the bunkers under fire. Uh, an M79 man to take another bunk under fire. There was this one brand new kid. I don't even know his name, a uh, little skinny guy. And uh, he had a, he had an M M60 and I told him to, to take another, a bunker under fire. And I said, you keep their heads down. You keep their heads down because I've got to go up there. And he had very disciplined fire. I remember thanking some instructor at the basic infantry school that this guy knew how to go brrrr. Because you burn your barrels up if you if you go too fast. Brrrp. And then I noticed that he was pumping blood out of his leg. When you're pumping blood, that's an arterial wound. He never said a word. He just kept kept firing. I don't know if he lived. Um, and then I stood up. And I started up the hill. I it, We got to get out of this situation. And... Uh, and I was probably, you know, five or 10 seconds up the hill heading for a bunker. I caught movement out of the corner of my eye and I thought I'm screwed. And I hit the ground again and came up to shoot. But I think it was an NVA soldier and it was Harding who was a squad leader. And then I looked behind Harding and there was the entire platoon coming up with me. Unbelievable. I mean, to this day, I just, you know, uh, that and, and when I earned the Navy Cross was when I stood up and started up the hill. The rest of it, which is in the citation, the kids rode up. I mean, yeah, I did all that stuff. I attacked bunkers and things like that. But where I earned my pay, where Major Miller's point was, it was yeah. somebody's got to move these these kids one right. way or the other. And Marines don't go back. So there's only one way up. Right. Oh, my I know we have questions here. Uh, Greg Yost, and I know you're you're probably just bursting with questions to ask Carl Merletti. Greg, yes, how are you? That, I'm doing well, doing well. Thank you for, for bringing him on. Carl, thank you so much for coming on. This is a, a terrific story. I've read some, I've leafed through some of your books and I got a, got a gist of it. I, uh, I, I also, for the, for the new people here, I have a, a question that I often ask veterans. I'm not a veteran myself. But I ask what I call the Norman Schwarzkopf question. And I once heard Schwarzkopf interviewed about his two tours during Vietnam. And the first was in 1967. The seventh, second one was in 70, 71. He said after he left in 67, his first tour of duty, when he left, he said he felt he had accomplished something. Wherever he was, whatever he was supposed to do, he felt he had accomplished something. His second tour of duty, he said, I didn't feel as though I accomplished anything. When I left, I said, I just didn't think I had done anything or our mission was, was of any value or anything like that. What did, for, for you and for the other new ones on, did you, when you left, did you feel as though in your little neck of the woods, you had accomplished something or was it just the same old, same old when you left as when you got there? Well, I wouldn't call it the same old, same old because... I was a different person and a lot of my friends had died. Um, but there's no doubt that I felt a se complete sense of uh, waste. I mean, we lost a lot of guys on that assault I just described, Hill 484, and uh, we abandoned it the next day. Just were ordered to go back to VCB. I mean, what, 
WTF. We didn't have that expression back then, but, you know, uh, so it was that feeling. I mean, he spent an entire year there and then the brass says, well, uh, we're, you know, we're just abandoning the hill. The Marines took Hill 484 three times. There's a famous David Douglas Duncan picture of a, of a, 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 a big black guy with, with a bandage around his head, reaching down on the, reaching up to, to some guy who's trying to pull him up. And that was, that was the first assault on 484 in 67. Mm-hmm. We abandoned it. And then we did it again and we abandoned it. And we did it my time, we abandoned it. Uh, so when you're leaving, I had that, I was just really happy to go home and uh, um, I didn't have any sense of accomplishment at all. Mm. Carol Wagoner, I just want to say hello, a fellow author. There you are, Carol. Thank you for joining us. You've had some comments in the chat here. I like this one. Did anyone have any pet monkeys? And did <laughs> they serve any functional purpose, such as warning if the enemy was nearby? That's a good question. It's a great question. We did not have any pets. Um, for starters, uh, monkeys would, would give away your position. Uh, so you just wouldn't do it. We, they were what we called rock apes. And they, they were, we called them that because it was like we, we, we would be on patrol. I mean, there were no roads. I mean, you're really out there with, with them. And they would throw rocks at us. I think it's because we ended their, their territory. I mean, literally, kaboom, you know, you hit your helmet and you look around and there'd be, there'd be this. I don't know. I mean, they were, they were like big monkeys. They were, you know, and they would throw things at us and uh, uh, we called them rock apes. So they were all around. And I definitely had the feeling that, you know, we were intruding on their turf, especially from their, them throwing rocks at us. And more than once that happened to us, but no combat unit would keep a monkey because you couldn't, uh, you couldn't keep it quiet. And, uh, I don't know if, they, if in the rear people kept monkeys, but we certainly didn't. Larry Woods, did you keep monkeys there in Tuiwa? No, we didn't. Uh, <laughs> no monkeys. Uh, but I do want to uh, just make a comment. I would urge everybody on the call tonight, if you haven't read Matterhorn, you really need to. It's an outstanding book. Carl, I'll tell you, I didn't enjoy it because I don't... <laughs> now, only, I don't enjoy... I, I, I was at, as uh, Todd said, I was at Tuiwa, was the Air Force and Security Police, mm-hmm. and have done a lot of, because of Todd, done a lot of reading, uh, probably 20, 30 different things on Vietnam. It's not that I enjoy them, I appreciate them. Right. I, and I really appreciated your book. Uh, you. Enjoy is, you know, a lighthearted read. Right. Yeah. Not lighthearted. These are, this is heartfelt, and it, it, uh, being Air Force, it wasn't Marines. I'm a good friend of Andy Niggett, and we've talked a lot. And I've read books written by his friend. And I understand what you guys went through, which was different. Everybody's story is different. So I really appreciate the story that you tell, uh, the way you tell it. And it's really worth taking the read and taking the time to read because it it captures what happened in i in, in a very real way. So I just wanted to make sure I thanked you for that, but also to encourage people that uh, are on the call that may have uh, been interested. It's something definitely worth picking up and reading. So thank you very much, Carl. Appreciate it. Well, thank you. That's nice. Uh, we, we, it was reviewed in the New York Times by Sebastian Younger. Uh, he wrote The Perfect Storm. Uh, he said it's uh, more of a tour of duty than a read. Yeah. He, he gave it a really good review, but he, he, said, he, he said it's more of a tour of duty than a read. It's a profound book. It's a profound book. I mean, you don't enjoy reading the Bible. <laughs> right. Yeah. Seriously, you yeah. learn from the Bible. You yeah. know what I mean? Um, here's a picture of you. Uh, yeah. This is what happened. What happened to your eye? Well, uh, on that assault that I just described, uh, as you said, they were they were in bunkers and holes, and uh, um, we were going. It's very steep, and um, we looked up, and and uh, two chai coms, you know, <coughs> potato masher hand grenades, K 
came flying through the air uh, right down on us. Now, I, I was just like looking at them and one of them exploded. Well, they both exploded, but the one uh, to this day, I go like, I don't know why I'm here, but I saw it split in half. I saw it split in half and the two halves, one went by one ear and the other one went by the other ear. And I was hit in the face with all kinds of sort of small, I don't know, the, the solder or something that was holding the, holding that thing together uh, and it knocked me unconscious. And, uh, um, and actually it blinded me uh, temporarily. And, uh, but my, my radio operator who at that point was a, a guy named King, Cleveland King, uh, he, 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 uh, I could, I, I came to, and I heard him saying, well, he's Coors and that means he's dead. And, and I said, no, I'm not. And he looked down at me and I said, I can't see. And he got his canteen out and he had, I can remember, I always remember he had, he had Bugs Bunny grape Kool-Aid in it. And he poured it in my eyes and got one eye working. And, uh, the other I never did get working and they, they I finally after several days later I was on the hospital ship and they operated on the eye got the shrapnel out of it and um, I was fine you know I mean I, I, I was we, we shipped out the the morning after this picture was taken on another operation and uh, um, that's the story of that eye that eye patch they, the kids started calling me patch <laughs> <laughs> Man, I'm looking at the clock here. We have eight. It's eight fifteen. I want to hear on the East Coast, and I want to, um, I want to get to your homecoming. And I imagine, you know, the story of the one part of the trauma of the Vietnam veteran experience is is the homecoming, as much as the war. Mm. Um, <clears throat> um, Thomas, you have something you want to ask or say, Thomas Gurnow? Yeah, I was going to ask Carl. When you wrote Matterhorn, and of course, what it's like to go to war, you know, two totally different uh, books, you know, one is your time in Vietnam, and of course, what it's like to go to, go to war incorporates that, but it also incorporates your feelings about war. Did you, when, did you feel that you, uh, you felt like you uh, were able to like, uh, get these uh, ghosts out to help you heal? Uh, from what you experienced through your combat? Yes. Um, I've, I've, I've said it uh, in, in other speeches like that uh, a, f a friend of mine, uh, uh, Joe Bobro, he, uh, he crystallized what was going on. He says, I was talking about writing and, and, and it, honestly, at times, I mean, I'd be sobbing. I mean, literally snot on the keyboard uh, or the typewriter. Cause when I first started Matterhorn, I was using a typewriter and he said, well, what you're doing is you're turning your ghosts into ancestors and uh, ghosts are the unconscious things that happen to you that you've stuffed. And they're ghosts haunt you. And they're and that's what gets you into bar fights. That's what you know gets you to drinking too much. That's what gets you into drugs, doesn't get you divorced. You've got to get it out in front of you. And when you get it out in front of you, and there's a lot of ways of doing that. I did it by writing. Those experiences, the you know, the guilt about killing an elephant. I don't know what I mean. I, I don't know if I killed him. I mean, anyway getting those experiences out i wrote that and i had to i had to write it down and look at it and it was out in front of me now and it's turned into an ancestor it's still part of me it's always going to be part of me but it doesn't haunt me anymore and the writing process and i think all art uh, is capable of doing that but there's many other ways of doing it. i mean join team rubicon uh, uh talk to your spouse uh um, you know, talk to a friend. I mean, it, there, there's many ways that you can turn these, your ghosts into ancestors, but there's no doubt that these two, these two books was my method. One of your ghosts appeared to you on a drive on a rainy night in the Pacific Northwest. And I think it was the ghost, I think it was 
the eyes of a NVA soldier. Yes. Who you killed <clears throat> yeah. right after your eye got wounded, right? Right. Yeah, it was. That was that same incident. Yeah. Yeah. It was just, just you know, minutes after it. Can you uh, like tell I, that? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, like I said, we were, we were looking up, there's a very steep hill. And uh, I came to, and, and it was like, well, we got to figure out where these grenades are coming from. And, we, and so we all, there were about, by, at this point, the, the assault had gotten, I mean, a lot of people think that, oh, well, you know, the, the Marines, it's all under control. The lieutenant's got the plan done. No, once you hit the bunkers and you, I mean, everything falls apart. And it's just individual Marines who know what to do to get the job done. That's the way it works is they know the objective, they know the mission and they're, they, they get it done by this. So I had this little group, my radio operator and uh, uh, a kid, Jake Ways, who, who I'd made platoon sergeant, he was 20 because uh, we'd lost everybody else. And uh, uh, it, was, it, was, it was the three of us. Uh, and um, so we throw our grenades up to try and get it into this hole where these grenades are coming down at us boom you know and, and then nothing then we'd see two more grenades come, come sailing down at us and, and you we, you had to go uphill because if you went downhill you went you went with the grenade and that would you know that wouldn't work that was a bad idea and then we we pulled our grenades and threw them again and finally the lieutenant's brain starts to work and i said you know i'm going to be out of grenades in two more throws and this is not working and so i turned to, to king and i said uh i'm going to go around and get them from the side so uh you go ahead and throw the next little bunch of grenades and that'll cover me and i'll go around the side and so i went around the side i went up the hill and i was just got into position on the side and one of the nva soldiers was already dead or one of our grenades had come up there. and the other one jumped it was was rising up from the hole um and he had a grenade in his hand and we locked eyes. And, I mean, like I said, my first combat experience, I never even saw an NBA soldier. It's really unusual to, to lock eyes. He was no more than 10, 12 feet from me. And I remember <laughs> saying under my breath, I couldn't speak Vietnamese. I, I just remember, you know, I, I had him in my sights, my M16. I just remember going like, don't throw it and I won't kill you. Don't throw it. I won't kill you. And he just snarled at me and threw it. And I pulled the trigger and I killed him. And uh, didn't think much of it because I was busy. I mean, I had to, you know, set up the, the defense for the counterattack that was sure to come that night and organize the defense. I mean, you're just busy, you know, and I didn't think of it for years. And then one night, as he said, I was driving up I-5 in the middle of the night, probably about one or two in the morning, and I saw those eyes in the windshield. Uh, now I'm sophisticated enough to know it wasn't a ghost, a real ghost, or that I was going crazy. I just, I just knew that I had to, I had to do something about the fact that I killed a person. He was a young kid, like our, like we were, and I killed him up front and personal. I couldn't say I killed a gook or I killed the enemy. I killed a person who looked me in the eyes and uh, I had to come to terms with it. And that's what motivated writing what it's like to go to war. John, you have your hand up. Yes, uh, Trey is joining us uh, on the YouTube side. Uh, Carl Trey is uh, one of our younger guys. Um, cooler. Uh, he says, this is an amazing talk. I was wondering how would an airstrike in Vietnam actually play out? We see it a lot in movies like Forrest Grump, but I have always wondered what actually happened. Thank you, Trey. And I do have to say, Trey is a high school student. We have another high school student mm. here, uh, Connor Richie. Good to see you, Connor. It's been a long time since I've seen you. Thanks for joining us from Louisiana. Yeah, Carl, what is an airstrike actually like when you're on the ground? and you assume the enemy is close to you, that means the airstrike has to be close to you. Oh, absolutely. Um, you, you get the shrap, you know. Uh, and uh, so when, the, when first of all, Marine Corps is, is, is 
lucky in that all of its pilots are trained as infantry officers at the basic school. So they understand infantry tactics. Uh, they know that they have to come in parallel to your lines instead of over them. And so they're less apt to hit you with a bomb. But when they're dropping, you know, 250 pound bombs, so I guess some of them even 500 pound bombs, they're, they're big and the ground shakes. The air is just unbelievable. I mean, the, the sound of the jet, you know, like a phantom going right over your head at maybe a hundred feet, I don't know, right on the deck. Uh, it, it just, it's just a, a, astounding. And, and, and I have to say it's thrilling because you know, they're on your side and they, and when those bombs drop, they, the ground shakes and the, and the shrapnel goes by you. I mean, you, you have to be down on the ground with your, you know, with your helmet on. Uh, so you don't get hurt. Um, and uh, it's, it's a, an amazing thing. I'm just thinking that why the Ukrainians can't make any headway. Yeah. They don't have, they don't have air power. You know, Marines make fun of the air force all the time. But by God, are we happy when they're around and, and they're on this? You know, and you you just don't you just don't don't operate in modern warfare without air ground coordination, and and the Ukrainians don't have it because they just don't have aircraft. Say, Carl, I was a a fac with uh, the twenty six Marines. Did you have a fac, a forward air controller, with you in in your battalion? The forward air controller in our battalion stayed at battalion headquarters. And uh, uh, who we had was what we called Fac Man. Uh, Fac Man was an air wing corporal. And he was the guy that uh, did called in the, the close air support and got the choppers in and that sort of stuff. But uh, uh, the actual liaison between the air wing and the battalion was with the battalion headquarters. Oh, well, this first lieutenant was with the platoons. Mm, yeah, that wasn't the way it was with us. Larry Jones, you have a question. Yeah, I have a question about the, uh, the lower ranking Marines under your command. First of all, were any of those Marines conscripted into the Marine Corps? Mm -hmm. No, uh, not in my, uh, this, I understand some were, I, I think, you know, uh, uh, not very many, almost all Marines are volunteers, but I was told that at some recruiting stations, the Marines would, had, were, had, were coming up short and, and that they would, the recruiting sergeant would go down the line and pick anybody who was six foot or taller. I don't know if that's true or not, uh -huh. but some Marines were conscripted, but we didn't have any in my, my company. Uh, what, one of the reasons I bring that up is because in the novel, there was conflict between the lower level um, Marine in the NCOs. And this at some point lent, lent, lent it to fragging. Am I getting that correct? Yeah, the, in the novel, I, I talk about, uh, I think there were over 200 fragments. And fragging means you throw a fragmentation grenade at somebody. Uh, and the way it was usually done is that it was in the rear areas and you would, uh, uh, the, the, the killer would would roll the grenade into the person's uh, hooch where they were sleeping, and uh, it was called a fragging. There were over two hundred of them, and almost all of them, in my opinion, were racially motivated. There was an enormous amount of racial tension. I mean, it, you know, that was Black Panther time. That was you know Watts, uh, Newark. I mean, the cities were going up in smoke. Martin Luther King was assassinated. I mean, this was a terrible time in American history. And uh, in the rear areas is where these fragments took place. Uh, it was two motivations. One is racial or a combination of racial and, and anger over uh, some uh, lifer, usually a, a person who made a career out of the Marine Corps, uh, pissing off some younger kid who, who had, a, you know, the mad monkey was, had, was, was murderous. Uh, and in Matterhorn, it, it's, it was, it, it's racially motivated. And I wanted to explore the race, the racial tension. I mean, you know, people talk about integrating the schools in America in, in the late sixties, 
uh, just imagine what it's like if every kid in that school had an M16 and hand grenades. I mean, it, it was, it was, it was tense and uh, out in the bush, it was amazing. And we go to reunions, the, you know, the black guys are right there with the rest of us. And uh, out in the bush, there was no issue except an underlying sort of, you know, grumbling about racism, which was evident. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you got back to a rear area, the dynamics were, were such that you did not want to be the only white guy with your black friends if the shit went down and you didn't want to be the only black guy with your white friends if the shit went down because you figured you'd die. I mean, it was scary. Everybody was armed. Yeah. Right. Everybody was armed. And uh, so as soon as you got back to the rear, the white guys and the black guys split up, even if you were best friends, which many of them were. But it's, it's interesting how the, the culture, the, marine, the, the military reflects the culture it comes from. And at that time, the United States was still, you know, in the South, totally segregated and in the North, you know, de facto segregated. And uh, as soon as you got back, as soon as you stopped being a unit facing a common enemy, whether you liked it or not, just to just to protect your own skin, you ended up with your group. It's sort of I, I, I like it. I hear it's the same way in prisons, whether you, you like it or not, you got to choose a side. Otherwise, you know, you're going to get raped. Right. So oh. uh, along the same line, um, when you had the occasion of uh, commanding these 43 younger um, Marines, uh, in his book, Philip Caputo, I believe that's his name, yeah. the 10,000 oh. they wore, he talks about, and I believe he was in the commander of an army infantry unit, but he went through the records and he was struck by the fact how, how many the, of the young boys under his command never graduated from high school and couldn't identify who their fathers were. He was a Marine, <laughs> Phil Caputo, uh, a great writer, really great writer. Right. Yeah, no, I mean, we had, uh, I, one of the things that's changed, you can't get into the Marine Corps today unless you've got a high school uh, diploma. And uh, if you've got any kind of record, you just won't get in. Uh, it, it's changed. Uh, but in the Vietnam War, I mean, we had we had guys that were you know uh, literally I mean I, I remember one kid named Kinder who who was there because he'd been he'd been picked up boosting cars in Chicago and the judge had said you know here's your choice kid you can go to Joliet which was a state penitentiary or you can join the Marines and, and he joined the Marines uh, it, that happened in the '60s wouldn't happen today uh, and uh, and the other thing is the socioeconomics. Uh, you could get out of the draft in the 60s if you stayed in college. There was something called the S2 deferment, student deferment. Mm -hmm. So it was terribly skewed uh, in the sense of, of who served. And kids that didn't go to college, which of course would be kids that didn't graduate from high school or, or, or came from, you know, messed up homes, uh, ended up, you know, either being drafted or saying, well, instead of being drafted, I'm going to go join the Marines. Um, and so... Uh, Phil's book is is accurate. And Philip Caputo's book, "A Rumor of War," is another classic, early classic from, of the Vietnam War. Yeah, he was there in '65, so right. he was there very early. Yeah. He was one of those Marines that landed ashore at Da Nang, March eighth, nineteen sixty-five, yeah. which you remember. Yeah. Um, I, I part of the education we get here at the Veterans Breakfast Club really is in the chat and from all the veterans who joined join us here in February nineteen sixty-six. Says John Pert. When I was drafted in St. Louis, every fourth man went to Paris Island as a draftee. Really? Uh, ben Wright says in 1969, one third of draftees went to the Marine Corps. Oh, no and kidding. And then Jim Berg, what Carl is referring to about fragging is right on in the rear area of 326. We had two incidents. Uh, this is what a wonderful evening we've spent with you, Carl. I know we're past time that I promised would keep you, but I do have one more question. I'm going to skip over the other questions I've had. I guess it's, my, it's, I guess it's more of a statement of amazement that you worked on Matterhorn for 30 years. It took you 30 years to sell that book to a publisher. I've read that publishers said early on, oh, no, the war is too fresh. And then in the 90s, eh, that's ancient history. I mean, it's yeah. like, 
did they give you a reason? Was it oh, just? Yeah. No, it's, you know, it, one of the things I've learned, if, if anybody out there is a struggling writer, you'll get letters from publishers and agents giving you ideas or reasons that they don't like your book. But quite frankly, the problem is they just don't think they can sell it and they can't explain to you why they don't think they can sell it. I mean, I think that's the, the bottom line. It was 35 years. And I honestly, I, I got, you know, no one wants to read about this war. We lost it. Uh, Hollywood's already done it. Full Metal Jacket, Platoon. I mean, the, the market's dead. Uh, two letters suggested during the 90s that I just, why don't I just, just change it to the desert because, you know, we were in desert storm and, and uh, maybe it worked better. And then later I had a couple of people suggest, well, it's about a group of Marines on a mountain. Why don't you just set it in Afghanistan? And then it would be, then, then we could sell that. So 35 years. And uh, like they say, a, a 35 year overnight success. One editor, executive editor, editor press, admitted, confessed to me, he said, you know, we go by our gut and our gut is wrong about 50% of the time. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, Grove Atlantic, Atlantic Monthly Press finally gave it a chance. And, you know, it uh, became a New York Times bestseller. Carl, thank you so much for devoting this time. I know this conversation isn't always easy, but I think it's such an important one. And you've shared such important information for all Americans and all people to hear. And I'm grateful that we have such a wonderful group here on the Zoom side and on the social media side to join us to be part of this conversation. I hope to see you again sometime, Carl. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure. It was great questions. Nice to meet all of you. We will be back on Monday night with another program. We will be focusing on especially Black experiences in the military with a, a couple of veterans, one another author. So I hope you'll join us next week. If you don't get our emails, let me know. You could email me at Todd, T-O-D-D, at veteransbreakfastclub.org, and we'll send you our schedule. Take care, everybody. Have a good evening. Thank you again, Carl. Thank you, Carl. Okay. Goodbye.